Uh, welcome. It's, uh, it's my honor and pleasure to moderate this panel today. My name is Robert Farris. I'm the research director at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society. Uh, we have a fabulous panel of really smart, experienced, clued in people here. They happen to be friends and colleagues as well, so I'm a little bit biased, but anyway, they, um, they really know their stuff. Uh, to my immediate right is, is Nagla Risk. She's a uh, professor at the American University in Cairo, <coughs> and she is also the uh, founder, I'm not gonna get the name of your institution wrong, of the, uh, the um, where are you, Nagla? You are the Access to Knowledge for Development Center. I know it is A2K for D, yeah. and that's why I can't read out the whole thing. Okay. Um, uh, to her right is uh, Dahlia Othman. Dahlia is a uh, fellow at the Berkman Center for the past two years. She's also a research a visiting, scholar. A visiting scholar at the Center for Civic Media at MIT. Um, to her right is Nadine Weheba. Did I say that right? And I don't even know your title. She works at the American University of Cairo as well, and she's the Grand Puba. What's your title there? I'm a researcher. At a researcher, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> fabulous. Um, Lena Atala is a uh, journalist who uh, right now is the chief editor for the uh, Mata Maser in Cairo. It's a web-based newspaper. She's also a researcher at the... Uh, at the center in Cairo, and at the far right is Faris Mabruk. Um, Faris is, uh, he's the director of the Arab Policy Institute. He's also um, leads the UNIS Social Business Global Acceleration Program. Um, the collection of us, along with other, a few other people here, have been engaged in a project to try to understand uh, how the network public sphere works in the, uh, in the Arab region. Uh, we, we borrow this term, the network public sphere, for, from Yokai Benkler, who uh, describes the network public sphere as an alternative avenue for media, uh, a place which kind of gets around the traditional gatekeepers, which is less under the control of government, which uh, provides an alternative for setting the agenda and the framing and for highlighting given topics uh, and articles um, of public interest. And so the general question on our mind here is how has this worked in the, in the Arab region and using uh, analytical and research tools at our disposal to do so. So these days we have a lot more data, we have a lot more tools in which to uh, study the network public sphere, which is wonderful. We're still learning as we go. We'll show you some of these tools and techniques today, but we're gonna focus more on some of the big picture items today as well. Um, We've gone through, I think, several waves of optimism and pessimism about digital tools in the, hand, in the hands of, of civil agents. Uh, I think before we knew anything about it, there was a lot of optimism about what they, what they would be able to do. Another wave of pessimism came through. Um, in the wake of the uprisings in the Arab region uh, several years ago, we saw again another wave of optimism coming through because this was, I think, much real, stronger evidence that in the hands of the right people, these could have a real effect on social and political processes. I think that optimism has also been tempered over the last couple of years. So these are some of the things that we're gonna talk about today. So what we're gonna do is do a couple rounds through the panel, um, take your uh, questions following that, and hopefully have a nice dialogue around these issues. And uh, what I'd love to do is start with you, Dahlia. I, Dahlia has been spending a lot of the past two years uh, looking at the Arab blogosphere and Twitter in a few countries as well. And I guess we're gonna start with the question of what's our general understanding of the network public sphere and how has it evolved over the last couple of years? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I wanted to, uh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to sort of focus mainly now on the Arab blogosphere. And uh, what you're seeing right now is a map of the blogosphere from 2014. It's a snapshot in time. Um, and it's something I guess we've built on. Uh, back in 2009, the Berkman Center did a study, uh, a, a study on the Arab blogosphere. And there were very interesting findings that came out of that. Uh, namely that, uh, you know, the blogosphere was used for, uh, 
a way to comment. It was a, per, a way for people to comment on certain things, be it political, be it social, cultural, or even religious. And so we decided post-revolutions that we would take another sort of snapshot and, and look at this uh, blogosphere again. And I'm going to keep it short and sweet and say like one main finding uh, in this was the fact that the Arab blogosphere is actually in decline. Uh, there aren't a lot of blogs out there anymore. And uh, what blogs that you see, there are quite a few of them that are online, but they're, they're, people aren't actively blogging. So they're available online, you could see them, but you see that they've stopped blogging. And there are certain, you know, some of the bloggers have chosen to explain why they, they've stopped blogging. They, they give their, they sort of write up their last blog, uh, and others just quit blogging. And what's interesting is that we see that uh, a lot in uh, the political blogs, uh, especially in Egypt. Uh, and what we see now is that people have refrained from blogging, but uh, sort of reflect their uh, political ideology through the banners they use. So you see a lot of bloggers from the Muslim Brotherhood who would put up banners that would indicate that they're uh, sort of supportive of, or, or bloggers for the Muslim Brotherhood. And on the other hand, you see Egyptians on, on the left who, who have their own separate banners as well. And so we're seeing that inactivity. Um, Saudi Arabia, for example, and I think this is a key issue, in the, in the 2009 uh, blogosphere, Saudi Arabia was the second largest sort of group or cluster of blogs. Uh, right now in the 2014th, it's almost disappeared. Uh, and you know, we say this in keeping in mind that a lot of uh, sort of, Saudi Arabia is the largest population in the Arab world that is actually active on Twitter. Uh, and so we can sort of discern that bloggers are slowly moving and shifting towards social media. So. Super, thanks Dali. So a couple things we need to come back to later. So one is the nature of pan-Arabic discussion here and uh, <laughs> the shifting platforms is clearly a, a big issue here. Yeah. So Lena, you've been a um, intimate observer of this. You've been reporting on it and living it for several years now. I wonder if you could uh, give us your perspectives as well, please. Okay, so um, I'm going to start with a quote from uh, one of our interviews in Cairo. Um, and it says, can you hear me? Okay. I feel the microphone is a bit far. Um, so the quote reads, since some time we have been used to a certain level of tolerance and acceptance because we all look alike and we are, we are all from one generation. Yes, there are differences, but not so stark like when we, take, when we take it to the streets. When we are talking on social media, we are happy, but if we say the same things on the street, we get beaten up. We had this confined place that now turned against us. This is the end of the quote. Um, and this is uh, an excerpt from um, one of our interviews uh, with an interlocutors um, as part of our research looking into the developments and the evolutions um, and the changing functions of Egypt's um, network public sphere. Uh, this person is a veteran blogger. Um, he had um, a blog, uh, one of those blogs that would probably be um, a dot in this um, map. Um, he is also an active, um, he has been an active social media user and his words resonated with um, those of others reflecting on how social media became less of an alternative home throughout the last two years in Egypt. Um, in descriptions of digitally mediated public spheres, the notion of an improved network architecture is brought on with the facilitation of access to expression um, re um, and reduced hierarchies and more horizontal modes of production, rendering political engagement more possible. Uh, while this possibility unfolded in several Arab contexts, um, it was also quickly connected to the Arab Spring mobilizations. And much of the attention shifted from the depiction of these constructed public spheres to um, how these public spheres should uh, be conducive to some kind of a mobilization. Um, the last two years, however, gave us an interesting possibility to better examine these publics outside the scope of mobilization without casting the burden of mobilization on them, mainly because there haven't been so much mobilization uh, in terms of state protests and so on in the last two years. Instead, it became a possibility to understand the formations of these publics um, and um, the extent of their influence. For many of the conversations we had, uh, parallels could be drawn to Benedict Anderson's imagined communities, 
whereby societies are formed not around face-to-face -face interactions, but through the imagination of individuals of being part of a community. This imagination is possible thanks to the access to the print industry, says Anderson, which helped um, disseminate material and content that led to um, the unfolding of shared values. Uh, the internet's imagined community has not only given access to um, a shared discourse, but it's actually um, actively engaged in con constructing that shared discourse. Uh, the similar sense of an imagined community has unfolded online in ways where um, active users expressed belonging to a certain intangible group that is not uh, a political party or that is not a labor union. Um, in this space, personal identification with surrounding events and their emotional register is key um, in shaping the community. Um, I'm going to quote also another uh, of our interlocutors, um, a famous programmer and activist who's who currently happens to be um, uh, facing uh, a prison sentence for on charges of protests. And he says in description, in describing this um, community, on Twitter, you are not really using it to talk to a public. You are using it to talk mostly to people who would be directly involved in your, comp in your popular committee, your work, or your refugee work, for instance. They may be your colleagues in the same thing, or just from a network that could be sympathetic uh, to the same cause. When you share the personal stuff, you are also talking to that same network or some subset of it. I think there's a lot of value when we start looking at emotional reasons and benefits from doing that. Even when you start sharing this, maybe with your family or within your work colleagues or whatever, it wouldn't have the same emotional register. And so we need this thing in order to find the same people who would have the same level of anxiety, depression, or happiness um, around certain events. Um, it shakes, these events shakes our, sh shake our world, but at the same time, the rest of the world doesn't actually treat them as such important events. And this is the end of the quote. Now, while Anderson, for Anderson, the nation is one such socially constructed and imagined community, this very nation started joining the digital platforms and shattering the sense of belonging that the early um, adopters had, as well as the sense of imagining it as um, a special community. Uh, online spaces became less sites of imagining the nations or alternative nations and uh, became more grounds of reasserting tangible realities and uh, the state-mediated version of the nation. Um, a growing sense of nationalism engineered by the state through the machinations of populism has been omnipresent online. This has come on the heels of a major regime change in Egypt, um, by the con where the con whereby the country's military institution came to replace um, an earlier um, Islamist regime. And um, with, while mass media played a major role in mediating this renewed sense of nationalism, online platforms became a more available space to a wider group of users to express it, share it, and defend it. It was also a space where traditional powerhouses, uh, namely the state, but also uh, powerful political groups and individuals and figures consolidated their presence. As such, and to end, looking um, into the changes that occurred over the public sphere in the last three, two years in Egypt, and in the digitally mediated one in particular, it is important to separ separate between two things. On one hand, there is the function of online platforms to the formation of political communities that can speak to the failing of the traditional political organizations, and this is something that should not be forgotten um, in um, the wake of um, talk about failures and successes and the wake of talking about, um, you know, the you know failure of online spaces for mobilizing change. Um, um, while you know, these practices online don't have to be necessarily geared towards major political change or on the ground action, they are important. They have been important spaces for conversation, discourse formation, and alternative political imagination. On the other hand, um, the expansion of digital spaces to become a bigger and larger host for the different publics of the nation lends itself to a different set of realities. While online spaces introduce different languages ideas as well as modes of expression and conversation to the public sphere, the advent of a more offline presence to online spheres reversed this dynamic. And as we see more alignment between the offline world and the online worlds today, a set of questions start rising. 
such as the, what are the new modes of production of nationalism um, engineered through a digitally medi mediated network public sphere, what does online spaces, um, how does online spaces, um, how do the online spaces, sorry, mediate the nation to a larger uh, network public sphere, and what are uh, the roles of the traditional powerhouses like the state in there? And finally, can there be um, still spaces reserved for communities of descent with some level of audibility as part of a truly network public sphere, or are they doomed to be diluted? Um, and if, is this inevitable? inevitable because of the growing volume of the network and the weakness of its interconnections. Um, I leave it to my other colleagues to, you know, try to hit these questions and thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Lena. There's a lot of great stuff there that I think we have time to pick up on later. Nagla, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you, Rob. Um, let me just take it from Lena. Lena spoke to us, uh, gave us the image, uh, the picture of what re truly happened in the decade of the 2000 to up to the uprisings of 2011 and then afterwards. What we see today is actually summarized by one of our um, interviewees who said in, in very simple language, the ground has come online. It's a very different world. That the public sphere, the network public sphere right now is a platform where you have the different groups, they joined, the, the early pioneers are joined by practically everybody. So the idea of this uh, space being uh, sort of uh, democratizing and providing opportunity for everybody has indeed been materialized to the point where not only do we have the pioneers the activists, but we also have hierarchies that now come in line and, and side by side by the achieve hierarchies. Examples of the interviewee that Lena talks about are people who achieve their status by their own um, achievements online, through what they said and spoke and through their blogs. These are people who achieve their status and their higher own hierarchies. Now we have the state, the media, top-down hierarchies that came uh, side by side by these uh, pioneers and actually uh, summarized also by this uh, by uh, the interview uh, we telling us a whole new country has joined us the people we argue with at home our family and friends are now present to argue with us on social media we are unable to change the way we speak to these new entrants online just like we have had our failings offline and our uh, disillusionment online, offline. So that's the, the fragmentation that has taken place by everybody joining in. This is a huge space where messages are diluted of the original pioneers, where messages cross, where actually a great deal of polarization takes place. And again, this is only reflective of the polarization that we see around us uh, on the ground. Uh, so in, at the same, uh, what uh, I refer to Yochai uh, Benkler's uh, in describing the network public sphere as uh, expressed in, in his book, basically uh, we had uh, what he calls the Babel objection, the Babel, the idea of the fragmentation, we do actually see around us a lot of that. In fact, we also see too much chaos and too, and too much centralization. We have the two trends side by side, just like I look at it as, you know, when you have centrifugal forces away from the center, giving forces to the small players, and at the same time, the opposite currents are taking place. You have the centripetal forces, Vertical hierarchies being established and very active online, as uh, Lina has alluded to. It is the kind of polarization that is at the level of the state. So it is something to, to deal with and to start and to realize and to, uh, to actually uh, start to, to, to see what, where this can uh, lead us. And the sad part is that the mass media is actually playing a role in the polarization. So you see this circular flow where uh, certain groups are actually quoted in the mass media, but of course it's, there is a selectivity that feeds into uh, the, polariz the polarization that is uh, taking place. Um, at the same time, I want to um, emphasize the, the relationship between these two worlds. When we talk of a network, public sphere in, in the Arab world, we really, we take a step back and we look at the Arab public sphere. It is a representation of the public sphere that we have with all its uniqueness, with all its own path. Perhaps we need to, um, you know, step back and, and think again. The, the public, the notion of the public sphere in, as presented by Habermas, the idea of, you know, capitalism uh, giving space to a democracy and political uh, debates and eventually the role of the media, We've had a different model in the Arab world. We need to study that model, and we need to really see the, the, the 
perhaps the, the achievements, and, but also the failures that we have in the public uh, sphere are also reflected in the network public sphere. So on a positive note, there is a role for um, looking at this from a different lens and from a different perspective and trying to see how we can use these technologies and devise new tools, perhaps novel tools, to study and assess what we see uh, around us. Um, uh, one of the, uh, I, I know that uh, two of the points that I want to emphasize, may that be the, the polarization and the, the mirroring or the extreme mirroring of the network public sphere to what is good to on the online spheres to what is going on offline we have seen this in our field work and I know that Nadine will show you will share with you uh, pictures that show that we have done uh, most of our interview all of our interviews actually focus groups with the different groups with the Islamists with the, uh, the regime you know the pro-military groups with what we call the non-aligned group and uh, you know third way or non-aligned group we have interviewed um, you know uh, different individuals from the Muslim Brotherhood and basically what we see as, uh, for example, the hierarchies in the Muslim Brotherhood uh, as an institution, their approach in dealing with social media was similar to that. So you see the, the, the hierarchies that are on the ground are actually coming to social media with their own values and their own mechanisms, with their own dynamics. So may that be the state or mainstream media or institutions like the Muslim Brotherhood. So it's no longer the world where we had the activists, you know, having space to interact and to impact a mobilization on the ground. I will stop there and then uh, I know that Nadine is going to um, follow up on that. Good, good. Yeah, so I just, I just want to highlight a couple things before I let Nadine take mm -hmm. over. So one of the things I hear from you is the prior notion of the network public sphere creating its own new hierarchy as being challenged by prior hierarchies now asserting themselves online. Mm -hmm. Also a filling in of the network public sphere. Mm -hmm. Concerns over fragmentation, polarization, got to come back to those for sure. Yeah. Nadine, please. Okay. Um. So what I wanted to show is a few um, illustrations of the points uh, Nagla was talking about and Lina on these, uh, uh, the nature of the offline and online dynamics in Egypt and the importance of looking at the context in which all this is taking place. Um, so these are images generated uh, using a software called WebRadar. And this basically collects and analyzes data from Facebook, Twitter, and different news websites. And it's developed by a company called Innova in Tunisia. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so what we see here, this is, um, um, a timeline of, um, of events uh, on the Tamarut campaign. Uh, this was the campaign launched around April 2013 um, against the rule of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Uh, what you see here is mentions on Facebook of the word uh, Tamarut. Um, so, and just to let you know, point B is when the, the campaign was launched on Facebook. And we don't really see a surge in the online conversation about the topic as a result of the creation of the Facebook page. What you um, versus, for example, there's a very famous uh, Facebook page in Egypt called uh, "We Are All Khaled Said," and this was created uh, after the, uh, the brutal murder of Khaled Said outside an internet cafe in Egypt by the police in 2010, and it's become synonymous with the uprising in Egypt. Uh, you don't see that effect with the Tamarut page. What you see instead is several peaks that take place after um, players from mainstream spheres like on TV or political parties or political figures endorsing the campaign. So just to give you an idea, for example, the first peak is when the April 6th uh, activist youth group announced their support for the campaign. The second peak is after um, a combination of different political parties endorsing their support for the campaign in mass media and in the press. Uh, the third and fourth peak represent uh, endorsements after um, the effect of endorsements from uh, prominent political figures and presidential candidates. And the fifth is obviously um, the one at uh, during the protests, the June 30 protests at the presidential palace in Egypt. And so what we can say here is that in terms um, of the relationship between the offline and uh, online spheres, we do see that mainstream players are perhaps more powerful in driving the conversation online and do remain to be very influential in the case of Tamaru. And uh, the next image, um, so the next image uh, kind of tries to illustrate what Nagla was talking about, about polarization. Um, let me tell you what this is. This illustrates, yeah, polarization specifically on Facebook. Uh, Facebook is this very important in Egypt. There's a six, this is a 16% penetration rate. We're talking about 14, almost 14 million Facebook users versus Twitter, where it's um, under 1% of the population. 
the period of time we're looking at here, or this is a snap you know, from 30th of June 2013 to around the end of August, and this is the time when the military government overthrew uh, the Islamic um, Islamist regime that was in power of the Muslim Brotherhood, and this was also during the forceful dispersal of the encampments at uh, Rabah al Adawiyah and in Nahda squares, uh, which were calling for the reinstatement of the deposed president. So what you can see here is posts shared on public Facebook pages. These uh, circles represent the sources of these posts, so the different pages, and their size represents the amount of posting on the, by the source. Uh, the distance between the circles yeah, is, um, is reflective of the extent to which they discuss common topics. Um, yeah, and the circles that are linked are discussing common topics, and they have a similar stance towards that topic. So you see clearly on your right, yeah, I think it's your right, a cluster of uh, Islamist-affiliated pages, whereas on your left you see one of uh, regime-affiliated pages, regime-supportive pages. And what we do notice is kind of an absence of pages uh, that represent the views of the, the non-aligned group. Uh, this could either because they be, and they did actually say this in our fieldwork, that they, some of them chose to disengage at uh, certain points, especially on Facebook. Um, uh, yeah, and so yeah, it's just that, so the point here is that this online, the online sphere, at least at this point, was in fact mirroring this offline polarization of discourse in Egypt, and it is reflective of what Lena was saying of a shift from more of a community of like-minded people to a, a whole country or a society coming online. Super, thank you, thank you, Nadine. Um, I think we were going to go. Uh, to, to Dahlia, so we're, we're going to have one, yes. one more view, Dalia's hold on, we're going to Tunisia next, but we're going to have one yes. more view of uh, Egypt before we go there. So, um, I just want to build on everything that was said already, and I think when we were comparing notes about our research uh, on the offline versus online, uh, and the Facebook versus Twitter, we, we were, I guess, maybe excited, maybe depressed, maybe, <laughs> I don't know, um, but we realized that a lot of the results in some sense were validated. Uh, uh, through our combined research. And uh, this is a map of, uh, a Twitter map of Egypt from 2014. Again, this is just a snapshot in time. But what is really significant about this map is that it's, um, there are distinct, very distinct groups of clusters. Uh, and each, basically each circle um, is uh, a handle, a Twitter handle. And uh, what we saw is that the map itself was divided on, uh, based on two themes. One was political and one was um, apolitical, social, cultural, you know, more of a personal thing that with basically users avoiding to talk about politics. But what was really, I think, very, very interesting is the distinct clusters or grouping of the political clusters. And so uh, what you see, and I don't know if the colors are very clear, uh, but the top, there's a green cluster. Uh, and those are people who align themselves with the military or support the military. Um, at the bottom here, the yellow is, are uh, people who align themselves with the Muslim Brotherhood. And what's interesting is that in the middle are the people that we're, we're labeling or calling basically non-aligned, who, who support neither the, Mus the military or the Muslim Brotherhood. And again, what's really interesting about this is the fact that they're very distinct groups. They're very divided. They're not, we don't see a lot of interlinking between them. Uh, and so that sort of uh, emphasizes the whole issue or the whole question of polarization. We, we really see that on Twitter as well, even though it's a 1%. But, uh, <laughs> but we do see that sort of reflection from the offline to the online. Super. Thank you. Thank you, Dai. Faris, let's hear about, uh, about what you've learned in Tunisia. Yeah. Um, yeah first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, I'm glad to be here. The, the, the subject is, is very important especially with the, all the transition and the changes uh, that we are now living and uh, witnessing in our countries. Um, what Understanding the, the, the Arab network public sphere is also important to understand how the, the to, to better understand individual behaviors, collective behaviors, and just maybe understand the radicalization, polarization. Uh, the good thing with, uh, with, uh, with the network our public sphere is that we, we have data. So once we have data, we can try to model, we can try to analyze. So let, uh, let, let me share with you some of the ongoing research we are doing to better understand the typical period of time on the uh, NPS network public uh, sphere. Uh, so typical, uh, what would a typical week 
look like. Uh, so we, we, we went this, uh, we, we, we had this approach saying that a typical week we would have like a production of information. So how many information are, are, are put in the, in, 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 in the system? How many publication? This is production. Then you have promotion. How many like, how many, how many share? And then you have interaction. How many comment? People are commenting. So that's what, this is the, the, the way to describe an, an, a typical week activity. And, uh, and, uh, and then we, so in, in, a, in a typical week in, in, uh, in Tunisia, we would have, oh, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. We, we would have uh, 62,000 new publications. This is Sorry. an average of 62,000 publication, and uh, and uh, each publication would have 20 likes, 10.7 shares, 4.4 comments, and it would reach 13,000 internet users. So this is a typical week, and uh, this is a normal week, let's say. And and then from there we we try to see what 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 happened in in singular points. What is an abnormal week? And what explains this abnormality or this singularity? Uh, interesting, so, so, so you have the, the, the data we just uh, went through, and, uh, and so you have the share, the command, the like, and then you have peaks. And the interesting part is that the peaks we, 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 we see on, on, on the online are exactly the ones which are related to some violent uh, events, generally violent events uh, uh, on the street. Uh, so we went through these peaks and tried to explain, trying to understand how, what is the relation between the online and the offline? Is there a relation of, there, there is a correlation, but, but then we'll have to explain, is there a certain point, certain, uh, I mean, sort of causality? Uh, we, we introduced uh, a level of violence in the publications, okay? So we, we, we have 1% of the publication in, in average that contains, that contain uh, a term, I mean, violence, pleasure, aggression, assassination, and so on. And the average number is 1%. But what we saw is that when, when the, the level of violence increase in the publication, the, 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 the level of which will, will, the level of comments which shares. So we have, we have higher number of share, higher number of comments. This was just to share with you the way to modelize and to come with a model that would explain the beha collective behavior on, 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 on the public sphere. And this is ongoing research. Hopefully we'll come with other, other results. Thank you, thank you very much, Faris. So we've uh, had kind of a, a few different overview looks at the network public sphere. We've started to dig into the data a little bit. I wanna start picking off a couple topics and start thinking of questions you wanna ask if any of these are of particular interest. So. One of the things that comes through from this is that the network public sphere is now reaching a broader cross-section of society. We wanna figure out whether that's good or bad. Good, we hope. Um, it's certainly a, a different world than when we looked at uh, the blogosphere five years ago and saw, I think, what was at that time elite bloggers um, talking and debating in long form um, complex political ideas and building coalitions now. And what you've shown us here tonight is very, very different than that. So the, the um, polarization in Facebook that we see, the topical selection in Facebook in Tunisia, the polarization um, in, in the Twitter networks there. Um, should we pause on this notion of polarization and ask about this? Is this an inevitability as the network public sphere becomes a better reflection of society at large? Is the network public sphere um, just a reflection really in becoming a better reflection of life underlying it? There used to be the sense that we would kind of 
create this alternative layer that would somehow be better at debate and deliberation and perhaps would help with these very complex collective decision problems and governance there. Is there a glimmer of hope left for that now or are we just going to go back and say it's business as usual and people are just taking their problems and their biases and their prejudices online and that's all we get. Please, sure. please do. I'll give it a shot. A little a, a breath of, of optimism, please. Yes, <laughs> yes actually, uh, yes, I will try. Well, uh, I'll keep the optimism till the end, okay. okay? I mean, one of the questions when we asked during the focus groups, you asked the group and you said, do you, you know, how do you, find, do you find the internet and the social media, is the internet democratizing? And somebody said, is it democratizing or dogmatizing? You know, and, and then... So on the one hand, it, it can help to exacerbate, you know, the differences and polarization and so on. But on a positive note, you think of it as, a, I mean, like democracy, when you open the door for every, you know, equality of opportunity and everybody comes in, you are bound to get results that you may not like very much. Right? I mean, that's a price you pay by opening the door and bringing everybody in. Now, in a moment of, of flux like we are living in Egypt and in Tunisia, I'm sure, what you see on the ground is this polarization. This is, and that's, I go back to the idea of the public sphere. This is the public sphere that we have everywhere. You know, there is a sense of, of there, is, there are tensions, tremendous tensions sometimes in the same family. So like you have the, you know, the, the tensions online and the, the fights that you have sometimes in the, in the, on the network, you also, it, it's also, also reflective of what is happening on the ground. So we would like to think that this is a, a period of transition where, you know, we are learning, just like, you know, our research, as researchers, we are learning, I think, as a people, we are learning, we are learning, hopefully, to, you know, to debate better, to, to accept the other better. I mean, a moment of, of modesty is in order. We have to learn to be tolerant and accepting. So, I mean, these are my two cents. I don't know if they're positive, but, yeah. Thank you. Please. Yeah, I... I, I Yes, I, I do believe the same in Tunisia. I mean, the, 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 the network public space is the mirror of what's happening in, uh, on the ground. But it's like, uh, you know, the sort of mirror that uh, exaggerating the, the default that uh, when you look to yourself, you, you, mm -hmm. it, I, I think it, it, it accentuating yeah. the, 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 the polarization, the, 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 all what's happening on, on, on the public sphere. Uh, this is one, two. Uh, the problem we have is the lack of media. Uh, in, in the survey we organized in Tunisia, reason number one people go online uh, on Facebook to get the news. Uh, in, the lack, in, the, in, in a situation where there is a lack of credible media, uh, Facebook became and has a completely different role, uh, I, I guess, from, from the role it has on, in, in, in other countries. So, so this created also a new role and a new, completely new structure. But in Tunisia, it's been a positive role from your perspective, the addition of alternative media sources. I, I, I mean, it played a role in, in, in the transition, in the beginning, I mean, in the revolution, yes. Then uh, we, we, we are still lacking uh, real media. Facebook is killing... The, the, the media, I mean, the, 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 the traditional media business model, because uh, all the, the, the advertising is going to into Facebook and Google, or, or all the traffic is going to, to Facebook and Google. So there is no chance today for, for, for traditional media to emerge. Uh, uh, in, in, I mean, it's very difficult for traditional media to emerge in Tunisia. And I do believe that traditional journalists, media are very essential for country to 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 to, uh, to to move forward, and I don't see this happening in Tunisia, due, uh, in part. I mean, uh, I don't know what you think, Lynn, about this, but it's more you. Yeah. I don't know if you had a question about media that can be saved for later, but. Um, Let's stay on media while, while we're talking <laughs> okay, about it. So yeah. uh, it, it's the network public sphere working in a sense in the way we hoped it would in highlighting through a meritocratic process better sources of information or people find al finding alternatives and views and are, is that being highlighted 
in a way that it would not be were it not for these digital tools. Um, yeah, if I might reflect on this a bit, I think as as um, a few of us have highlighted um, the you know, traditional powerhouses on the ground have also uh, managed to learn so much how to navigate um, online spaces and to create also spaces of power for themselves in these, um, in these um, you know, spheres. And hence, they've, bec they've become, um, you know, dominant uh, players um, in the network public sphere. So mainstream media, uh, mass media, um, the sense of Egypt, you know, te major television channels, uh, major um, corporate media um, have become the most widely uh, followed sources of information online as well as they are offline. So in a sense, um, this is a shift uh, from um, you know, from the, the, you know, infancy stage of uh, online spaces uh, where, you know, the volume of presence there uh, was much smaller, but at the same time there was much more influence uh, by smaller uh, players. Um, so definitely um, there is an issue. Uh, I share also Ferris's concerns of, of, of you know, um, uh, online media and not online media, but social media in particular, Facebook in particular, um, also not always uh, playing a very positive role for the highlighting of um, uh, smaller media practices, uh, mainly due to, um, you know, it's the advertisement model, mainly due to, you know, the selectivity uh, in which um, posts are, um, are streamlined um, in, in, paper, in people's streams. So, so there is definitely a growing um, um, bias against uh, alternative sources of media uh, nowadays. A note to that. I think that's. Uh, I think what you said is very important uh, in the sense of navigating these platforms. And it seems like a lot of the uh, sort of governments or people, like the the hierarchy, has been established because they've been able to navigate those platforms. And I think we need to take a step back and look at how these platforms were built, what algorithms they use, how these uh, sort of uh, feeds were promoted or certain posts are promoted. And I think that's very, that goes, loops back into the sort of reflection, the offline and the online. I think uh, for activists, there needs to be some certain uh, form of awareness of, of what these platforms can do and cannot do and how to na navigate them and maybe possibly part of that reason is because we are using platforms that were not built for social mobilization. They were, they were built as social networks and there are certain specific algorithms that are tied to that. And so that's, I mean, that could drive the question of, of are we going to stick to Facebook and Twitter or what's next? I think that's the question. Sure. Do you want to stay on this? I, I love this topic. Please do. Yeah. 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 If I may, I just have a quick follow up on this. I think one of the questions that I, I was telling my, you know, uh, colleagues that I went back to reading Yochai Benkler, and one of the questions that he raises in his book is the internet too chaotic, too centralized, or neither to promote democracy? And his answer is that it's neither. It's not too chaotic. It's not too centralized to promote a democratic discourse. Now, looking at Egypt around me, I'm just wondering, I think there, it, it is too chaotic and it is too centralized, and I'm not sure that combination as it exists in Egypt is, is enough or is good enough to promote a democratic discourse. Precisely because of what you said, because of the high media concentration, because the content that is included by virtue of the ownership of, this, uh, of these media platforms, by their you know, allegiance to the state, by the selectivity of how they use the, the content on the internet, that it can become a very dangerous tool and also um, emphasized and distorted and ex exaggerated because of that mirror. So this is a time perhaps again to, re, you know, to rethink these questions and as, does, does that answer hold today? I, I think we need to think a bit more to answer that question in view of what we look around. Hmm. So, uh, so I want to hear more about this. this. This is fascinating and I kind of want to merge the two of these things, which is how much of that is a function and is it related to the choice of platforms? So we've seen the shift from more open media in the blogosphere to a lot of the network public sphere residing on Twitter and on Facebook, which have their own architectures, which tend to nudge behaviors in a given way. 
and that's kind of colliding with the underlying kind of perceptions and the opinions and the ideals. Uh, do we blame this on Twitter and Facebook? What do, is there a better approach to this? What do, how, how do we look at this? What are, what are the kind of the affordances of these platforms that are helpful for debate and deliberation? And which aspects of these are, are detrimental? Are these just engines of chaos and centralization, as you, as you call them? I'm not sure we know the answer to them, but they, yeah. they feel to me like very, very important questions to be asking. Yeah, that's a difficult question. Yeah. I can, if I yeah. might start reflecting on it with you guys, I think, um, I think there was always a merit to the long post, um, which is the, you know, the main content uh, of uh, the blogs. Um, you know, in the space of a long post, uh, chances are you manage to make uh, a fuller argument and chances are you force the, you know, person who's reading to reflect more deeply um, in the space of this longer piece of content uh, as opposed to, um, you know, having to hastily react to a shorter post, mm -hmm. uh, be it on Facebook or Twitter. So definitely the, you know, the, the form of the platform um, affects the types of ensuing conversations. Um, and, you know, the fact that, you know, there has been a migration from, um, you know, the blogosphere to um, spaces of, pla of, the, of Twitter and Facebook, whereby, you know, um, we find um, much more, um, like, shorter uh, pieces of content uh, here and there, um, is affecting the quality of the debate. That's sad, and I think this is something we referred to earlier today in our conversation. It's interesting how many people um, from the blogosphere world have brought the blogging tradition to Facebook by only engaging through, you know, the writing of longer posts. Uh, and these tend to be, again, sites of more interesting conversations than the, you know, shorter pieces of content. In fact, in my newspaper, we tend to look around for these, and when we find an interesting conversation happening in the aftermath of a long post, we actually contact the author and, you know, ask them to develop a piece of um, an op-ed based on this uh, Facebook post. So that's... Yeah, w one 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 major change I see happening now in, in especially in Facebook and uh, and Twitter in uh, in the Arab world um, is the sec security of uh, I mean during a certain period of time in 2010 uh, during the evolution uh, Facebook were were the most secure I mean safe place to to take risk and publish why because of the community because of the impact you had and because the governments were not, you know, um, comfortable with attacking someone for, for posting on Facebook. But today, even in Tunisia, where, where we supposed to have, a, I mean, democracy, uh, people are, 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 are also, uh, you know, arrested. Mm. Uh, and, and, and there is a lack of, you know, clear uh, reglementation. I mean, how, how do we manage? I mean, is it the public? Is it the public sphere? Is it the private sphere? Can you? What is the other limit? You can, you can, you can, you can post on Facebook. Um, so there is also a chance of this, and, and maybe the, the 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 way because it's no more the safe way to to publish. It will probably change the 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 type of you know content we have, and definitely the world of it. I want to see if there's any questions from the audience. I have 20 more myself. We'll start here and then go to the back. Yeah. I have a really simple question, and it's an untutored. Um, I work a lot on crisis mapping, and I'm thinking about platforms like Ushahidi. I mean, it's such a different, it's like designed to be thin data, right? So I'm curious whether you've looked at that, those kinds of platforms, particularly the ones that are free. And I mean, I've, I, I work on Syria, and I've seen some of the maps that are generated through them, and I think there's real methodological problems, but I can imagine that there might be interesting conversations that come out of using those platforms or I mean, if in fact you're going for the ultra short post or the crowdsourcing or this kind of, I, don't, I just, I'm wondering as people who've thought more deeply about what you guys think about, like, I'm curious if you've, if you've thrown that into the mix or if that's just sort of a, analytically a different project. I think, too big of a question. I'll take a whack at that while you guys are thinking. So that's a really good question. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of valuable stuff to learn there. There's of course, a profusion of platforms to look at, and we haven't gotten there yet. 
It's, it's a very interesting question, which is if you want to understand what's going on online and civil discourse, what do you study? And in the Middle East, the answer right now is Twitter and Facebook. That's where you go. Uh, that's where a large uh, majority of the ideas are. And the question that we don't fully know the answer to is that really a good reflection of the totality of views that are taking place uh, under, underneath? My guess is it's pretty close, but I'm not sure. Not sure. Are you following up on that, or are you going to a new question? Uh, so I'll, co I'll come back to you. I'm I promised a gentleman in the back. I'm following yeah. up on it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm following up on your point and directly to your point as well. On my way over here today, I had the uh, benefit of spending some time with a retired Marine who now works for Fidelity Investments in the enterprise. Uh, app enterprise architecture department and he does nothing but platforms and you made the assertion that people are being arrested for making posts on Facebook so I'm wondering you know we had some measure of success with Voice of America Radio and its heyday and I'm wondering is there not some platform or group or organization that can develop a totally encrypted, uh, nameless, faceless, traceless voice of freedom for all members on the planet to be able to feel free to speak the truth? Great question. Who wants to feel that? Me again? No, I'm not answering all the I'm the moderator. I think there are platforms that do <laughs> offer that where you're completely anonymous in, uh, or your data is, I would say, maybe 90% anonymous. I'm blanking on names. I know we've like talked about them in the Berkman community. Uh, um, and, and there are platforms. The question is, I think, uh, sort of to build on what you're saying is, um, if you have a completely, there's, you have to consider security as, as one aspect of a platform, but then you have to think about the community element or, ha, uh, or having the ability to communicate ideas and information, having some form uh, a trusted source and, and being able to organize. And I think um, being completely anonymous might create an obstacle for that, so. But it's better than being arrested and tortured. <laughs> yes, but, but there's a sort of, you, you get to do a cost benefit or sort of balance, like weight out basically and see, you know, security versus, uh, versus complete, yeah, impact. And I mean, I don't know what the answer to, to that would be of maybe there's a platform that would combine both or, or doing some more offline social mobilization. I mean, I, I'm I also... The Marine to, uh, look into a and, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to add on this. I, 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 I have to jump in. So um, there are ways to maintain anonymity online. None of them are 100%, but some of them are 99%. And if you really want to speak anonymously online and have the knowledge and the technical chops, you can do it. Um, it's hard to do that and also join a community of people and have a real impact in the world. And um, most um, people interested in civil rights know that. And for that reason, you see people taking uh, a lot of calculated risks by speaking out in their own voice with their own face. And that's the decisions that they make. It's a hard decision. I'm not sure I would make the same decision, but it's a decision that people make. If you want to be on Twitter and be anonymous and you live in Tunisia, you can do it. If you want to be on Facebook and be anonymous and you live in Tunisia, you can get away with it as long as no one um, flags your account as being under someone else's name and take you down. But there are avenues in which to do that. The, the, my last thought on that is that uh, getting ideas out there is actually pretty easy and very hard to block ideas. The things that have a real impact on the world is the creation of networks and communities. And doing that anonymously is really, really hard. And there aren't many examples of it. The group Anonymous, I think, is, is the one exception out there. Can you block the geo position tracking tool? Uh, I don't know. That's beyond my technical know-how. Somebody might be able to flag that one. Yeah. You can opt not to do that. So I think it can be inferred from 
Oh, well, so on Twitter and that kind of thing, Absolutely. you can you can opt out of that. Certainly. So if you're if you're on a Western platform, if you're on Facebook and Twitter and um, are diligent about maintaining security, the only way that a government could get access to your information is if Twitter or Facebook turn it over, and they don't do that routinely. Uh, but nonetheless, people still use well. Depends on the. I, I, should, I shouldn't speak to that. <laughs> it depends on on the rationale for it. They they put up a fight often. Uh, if there's a good legal rationale for turning the, the data over, um, they do it, and that's to standard by that. Some pe people disagree on whether they should be pushing back more than they do, um, but they have pushed back in many cases more than they have to. Um, you want you had a question. Yeah, well, I was just, um, so there's some research just coming out recently about how few people understand the algorithm, or that there is an algorithm curating their Facebook feed. Um, and I think there was, Twitter has been experimenting with, a little bit with what they do, but mostly Twitter has been a platform where you just get this continuous stream, um, and there isn't kind of just however many people you subscribe to, however many times they post, you're going to see that. Uh, so it's a fundamentally different model for distributing content. And I'm wondering if any of you who've spanned both networks, uh, rather than looking at them in isolation, if, if at all you've tried to compare uh, you know, how well the content reflects the, the, what you believe to be the ground truth uh, as a result? So you're, you're asking whether they believe that the algorithm is filtering what you see in these places in a meaningful way. Well, it's, it's, it's certainly filtering it, right? And I'm just wondering yeah. if you've actually observed meaningful differences as a result of one platform doing heavy-duty filtering that people aren't even necessarily aware of, whereas the other isn't. Yeah. Well, I'm, um, I'm, I'm trying to think. I mean, I don't know if that answers your question, but there have, uh, has been a, there have been a number of uh, cases where activists have... Um, maybe use Twitter instead of Facebook to get their message across because of this issue. So they were able to fully understand, or I don't want to say fully understand, to, uh, to have some form of understanding of how the hashtag sort of, uh, how to create a trending hashtag works. And so they were able to sort of work within that algorithm to highlight certain trending hashtags. I know this definitely happened with the, um, the Palestinian prisoners' hunger strike. Uh, they they were they had a very specific set of of sort of steps that they would take so that the hashtag would be, would become a, a trending one. And so I think there is some awareness, but with a uh, maybe I'm not entirely sure about Facebook. Um, and I think because but you did say something about public posting, public versus private, and I'm I'm. So there is some understanding, and I'm going to let you talk more about that. So, so there was an example out of the United States, and maybe this is at the base of your question, and after the, the Ferguson protests, there were people noticing that their Twitter feed was full of information about the protests in Ferguson, and that on Facebook there was next to nothing about it. It's, do, you, are, do, you, do you see similar things in, in the Arab world? I think um, I think the fact that even though Twitter has very little penetration in the Arab world, um, and Nadine had the numbers, I think, or Nagla, I don't remember. Yeah. So even though Twitter had the uh, has uh, like far less penetration than Facebook, it has always been treated by people who feel like they are here to broadcast a message. Um, it has been used more often uh, than Facebook uh, because there is um, this this uh, this feel that nothing will be censored. It will just everything will flow everything, and there is a better sense of archive. There is a better sense of traceability um, in in Twitter in people's mind uh, than in Facebook. And that's not judging from any data. That's judging from you know observation and personal practice. Um, personal practice as you know as an activist, but also as someone who's running a newspaper and who has to navigate uh, you know the posting of content between both these media. Again, with you know this very small percentage of Twitter penetration um, in Egypt. Um, you know, it, it might not make sense to invest in it. But again, the fact that there is a better sense of traceability of this content on Twitter makes us still want to stay active on Twitter um, and not just, you know, restrain ourselves to Facebook. So. Uh, 
Yeah, I also see this happening for the for the media, for the traditional media. I know that um, Facebook has a function when you create a page, Facebook page, as a media, as a traditional media. If you have this page validated, validated by Facebook, uh, then the, it will appear. I mean, it will increase the number of of uh, time it will uh, it will appear in, in, in timeline. So it will increase the number of uh, likers and followers and so on. Uh, so th this is maybe a way for Facebook to, to, to give more credibility to the, to the content uh, you have. At least I saw it in Tunisia. I know that the, the two or three media that had increased the number of followers uh, had, had their pages validated. And this validation is, is proof of credibility. Or at least it is a very positive way to credibilize. No, I just had a quick follow-up, actually anecdotal evidence on the use of Twitter versus Facebook, building on, on what Tina says. It was very prominent, even despite the low percentage of users, it was very prominent in delivering a message during for mobilization during the uprisings. But one of the things that we found also from uh, fieldwork on the ground are quotes by, you know, non-aligned group or activists who said, in the beginning, we used to put out a tweet and it would mobilize people to go out on the streets, you know, in large numbers. Now, with the, you know, with the, with the uh, public sphere, with the internet being so populated and so busy with everyone being online, that message is diluted and that impact is not felt by the activists anymore. In fact, one of the activists put his um, status on Facebook uh, which was very interesting because he said Twitter now feels like you've gone to your, you enter your own home and you find other people living in it and pretend that they know you. And then, you know, they're using your stuff. And it was very funny. And he says, if you agree, uh, retweet, I mean, like. You know, he's on Facebook. So, so it just these things give you a sense of, of I go back to, to my earlier point about, you know, and also what Lena mentioned about this, you know, the pioneers who, who played the role in, in sending out messages through the platforms are sort of taking a different stance, taking a stance that is a slower and more calmer stance than being out there believing that their message will be delivered for, towards mobilization. Can, can I stay in, in this area for a while? So w one of the aspirations of this research was to try to better understand kind of the f reflection and connectivity between the online and offline world. Um, we used to, a long time ago, have debates about blogs versus journalists, and that's long gone, finally. Um, we still talk in terms of online and offline, and I think that distinction is softening over time. Um, particularly as more people get online and just people's lives are both. And to make that distinction for most of us really isn't that relevant anymore. But um, penetration in Egypt is now almost 60% yeah. internet penetration. Yeah. Facebook much less. Twitter 1%. Is that what you said? No, yeah. So there is perhaps a meaningful distinction there. I don't know if you know the numbers for Tunisia. They're probably a little bit higher, but not that different, yeah. Um, what did you learn from your interviews with people about kind of this intersection, the connect, connection between online and offline worlds? Well, well, certainly, there's, it's not a binary anymore because the two worlds intersect. It's about the dynamics between the two worlds and they feed into each other. There was um, actually a, a tweet early on during the uprisings and says that usually we learn that if you tweet a piece of news, you have to put a link to a media source, a mainstream media source. But now mainstream media are quoting us because we are taking pictures on the ground. So it's become full circle, you know. So, so I mean, the, the word that's happening on mainstream media or on, online or just in people's on the ground with families, they're so intersected. And again, the polarization, just like it's happening online, it's happening with disagreements within, you know, <laughs> one's own family. These things are happening. There is no, uh, it's a blur. It is just one word. And coming, I mean, the, the statement, the, the ground has come online is actually very indicative. We have anecdotal examples from, um, you know, and I know that we have from the, uh, for example, uh, Tamarud uh, interview, interviewed uh, one of the uh, you know, few members of the Tamarud campaign that Nadine has shown. And we have found several pieces of evidence that uh, you know, the activities on the ground were actually what triggered action. So it's hard to, to divide. And the binary is no, I don't think the binary is, is valid anymore. The question is, how can we work with the dynamics between these worlds and how can we study what's happening in the natural public sphere in a meaningful way to promote you know, positive or optimistic uh, results? So. 
Any other thoughts on that? What she said. What she said. <laughs> she said it very, very well. Yeah. <laughs> other questions from, from you guys? Yeah. Please over here, and then we'll come back there. Is it feasible, uh, given the political context in the countries, to make use of social media, social media platforms, to have a kind of mediated conversation, facilitate conversation between the different points of view that are now populating the various platforms in countries? I know that Twitter does town halls and things like that, but has any consideration been given to that possibility? I think you've stumped the panel. Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. <laughs> Do you want to chip in? We have an answer from Nevan. I think the way this solution is that if someone does something, some, like if you start a debate or if someone is, it usually ends up being rude or it crosses the line and you end up blocking that person or deleting that person. It's not really a room for communication. You just, you, people want to say what they say and if, and a lot of people post uh, like comments or like statuses and they say, if you disagree or if you have something rude to say, just refrain from commenting at all. So I think that's, yeah. that has been my experience or what I've seen personally. On, on I, I wonder who would yeah. moderate. I, I, can, I can maybe give a shot at that. Sure. Following up on, on Naram. I think, I mean, we have to think that in this part of the world, we're still, we've had authoritarian regimes for a very long time. And before that, we had colonialism. So we really have, you know, we're learning. We have a lot to um, adjust and a lot to develop. So to say this positively, and that goes to uh, perhaps the earlier point of the uniqueness of the Arab public sphere, not, I mean, the network as a reflection of what we have online. So we have a lot to learn. We are, you know, we are uh, young. I'd like to think of us as young democracies, you know, or on the way to being a young democracy. So we are learning as we go across. And I think that's, that's part of the, perhaps the, the frustration and the failures. I mean, the frustration is for everyone. The frustration is for the non-aligned activist group. Uh, it, but this is, I mean, we have to, again, to, it's a moment where we have to be modest and we have to admit to our own failures, the ability to engage, the ability to build uh, you know, a dialogue on the ground, on, offline, online. We're still working on that, so. Yeah. I agree with that. It, I, it's an unsolved problem. And it's not only a technical problem, it's a human problem. We're just not as good at open-minded debate and deliberation as we would like to be. And technology tools perhaps still help uh, in some sense. I think strong moderation is a really good thing and helps in any context, <laughs> online, offline. Yeah. Even with mediocre moderation, you can get by sometimes. <laughs> but uh, anyway, lots of work to be done there. Yeah, yeah. please. <laughs> Hi. Um, so you've made this point a couple of times that the Arab public sphere is different from the, the traditional Habermasian and Western public sphere. And I'm wondering if you can sort of detail uh, what that means to you and if the other panelists agree with that notion. Sorry, there's a part B. Um, Dalia, I think you mentioned that, uh, that the Arab world uses sort of Western-centric platforms or platforms that are developed primarily originally for Western audiences, Facebook, Twitter. And I'm wondering sort of 10, 15 years down the road if you think uh, the public sphere is going to still be concentrated on those platforms. Okay, yes. No, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm like, <laughs> okay. Or if there are going to be, or globally, uh, if there's yeah. going to be sort of a uh, more local nation state based or community local based uh, platform. Yeah. Well, this is a very sensitive topic and I, I certainly have to tread this very carefully because I don't want to be understood the wrong way. I don't want to be in, in any way saying that you know, we are not fit for democracy. I think the, the, the idea of uh, what the Arab world experienced was at moments of, um, of openness and of, of if you will, um, intellectual early in the 20th century, it was a moment where people who were, um, you know, revolutionary, not revolutionary in the sense of going out in the street and protesting, but revolutionary thinkers had a common uh, goal, you know, to, to get rid of colonization. So it was a way, there was a consensus towards this, 
but I don't think we have had as a long uh, pattern, as a, as a catalog, if you will. The Habermas catalog is, is a certain, you know, this, 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 this happened, and then you reach the case where you have democracy, and then the, you know, with the internet, there's a network public sphere, and this is a natural um, uh, growth of, of a democracy that developed throughout a certain period of history. We had a different path in the Arab world. We had colonization, and there, when there were debates and spaces, uh, may that be the mosques or the cafes or you know the inter intellectuals, it the, the, the goal was more or less common to get rid of the colonizer. But the sad news is that when we got rid of the colonizer, we had authoritarian regimes, and then it was sort of a setback. So we do not have long stretch of a natural birth, if you will, of, of democracy. We're struggling to get there. So we had you know, uh, some hurdles and hindrances, and we are getting there, but it's going to take some time. So in a way, we had, um, I mean, when the internet came and with you know, the 2000s, there was a big, uh, there was big hope, and there was big space that was open for the young youth you know, using the, the technologies. But then things did not develop as we would have liked. And what happens is that you have a populist, really what you have, we have populist politics, and we have, uh, activists facing, uh, you know, being uh, threatened even in the psychological sense, not just from the regimes, uh, but also from society. We, we have, we're still developing that culture of debate. We will get there. I'm not, I don't want to put the, the Arab public sphere in any negative light. That's not the intention. The intention is to just take a moment and really realize what are the strengths, where are we heading, and how can we get there? In and using our own model, it may not, be, it will not be the you know following a catalog of what happened in the West, and that's no different than actually uh, this course in, in development, for example. And, you know, if you look at the development of how the, the path for developing countries, it, it's it, they will not follow the same path that took place in, in the West or in developed countries, but they will develop their own paths. And we look at you know the emerging economies and we look at new uh, models of development that are unique to their own spaces. So that's really what I hope that clarifies, uh, you know, what I mentioned. Thanks. To Ready? top that, I think it's also worth noting that uh, sort of the adoption of technology and the evolution of that adoption has changed, uh, has been different for the Arab world. And so uh, looking at sort of pre-revolutions and who was actually using these platforms, the elite, and then sort of this sudden surge of people who started using all these different yeah. platforms. And I know that we're, we've also been looking at sort of media as well and how media is covering certain uh, topics through a different tool we use at Berkman, which is Media Cloud. And what we, all, one of the techniques that we use is sort of looking at the link economy of how sort of media sources link to each other. Uh, and what we're realizing slowly is, uh, or what we're starting to realize, um, it's not a final sort of conclusion, but is that in the Arab world, there's not much of a link economy. So you don't see that sort of influence through, through and attention through the link economy. And that's a very, very different usage than, uh, than, the, Arab, uh, than the Western world. And so that's, that's something worth digging into and trying to understand why that is the case. Um, and to answer your question, or at least attempt to answer it, I wish I could really predict what's going to happen in the long term. Uh, and, and if anyone else has an answer, please uh, jump in. I think um, there's an interesting uh, rise of tech startups that are happening in the Middle East. And there are some platforms that are emerging <coughs> from those startups. Uh, I think there is a future in that, but the question is whether those platforms are modeled after Western platforms or ha are more of a sort of original coming out of the culture, coming out of society platforms. I, I really can't predict what's going to happen in 10, 15 uh, years. There might be a shift to those platforms. Uh, there might be sort of a burnout in, in the use of, of Facebook and Twitter, and we're certainly seeing more of that with the non-aligned activists sort of taking a, a step back and, and not being active on these platforms anymore. So I don't know if there is this one platform that will emerge from the Middle East, or it might emerge from the West, and people will start adopting that. Uh, technology as a whole is changing. We're seeing more wearable technology. We're seeing, you know, I. I can't predict. I wish I could. I'd make a lot of money. You would tell us if you could. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'd make a lot of money. <laughs> if I might just have also a quick thought on this. I, I mean, I don't know 
what are like um, cultural intentionalities associated with the building of these platforms. But um, what I know is that, uh, you know, again, the early adopters, when they got online, they managed to adapt these spaces to their needs. Um, and, you know, the way they use it, they, the way they domesticated these, these platforms made their, you know, space of origins quite, you know, irrelevant, agnostic, right? It's it's really about, and you know, an example is, for example, this interview we who was talking about how, you know, Twitter became the alternative space to the traditional leftist political organization uh, on the ground in a typical Arab city, whereby, you know, there is much more attention to the individualities involved in the, in the collective, there is much more attention to the emotional register, and these are things you don't find much in the traditional um, organization, political organizational organization type. So, in, in a sense, there was this process of adaptation um, that basically centers the agency um, on the users, on the way the users have socialized um, um, and, and you know adapted these platforms, and I think that's very important. And to also add that there have been a few actually attempts to build uh, platforms in the Arab world that would mimic what Twitter does, and would they would originate from the Arab world, such as Dakwak and a couple of other examples, but they failed tremendously. You know, they maybe tried to. Um, um, address certain things such as language issues, semantics, all these different things, but they didn't work. People remained on Twitter and, you know, continued to be very happy on Twitter for a long time up until the crowdedness happened and, you know, we're having a, a different situation there. So I think it's important to, like, remember, and this is what I've been trying to get at, it's important to remember, even, even though there is a disillusionment from, um, you know, uh, and, a network public sphere in the Arab world and in Egypt, we have to go back and remember that it, there was a successful um, yeah. production of discourse um, on these spaces by these early adopters that shouldn't be um, uh, trashed completely, and their success lied in their ability to imagine something alternative or something different as opposed to just representing what's happening on the ground as is. And I think that this is the missing link, that, you know, in fact, the online and the offline are too aligned, are too much mirroring each other, that there isn't like a space, an alternative space of imagination online somehow. So. That's really interesting. I'm, mm. I'm so tempted to end on that, but I, I, I will see if there's a, a final question, the, if anyone has one to add to that. Sarah, please. <laughs> So I've been following the, um, the Western media, especially in Europe, about the Arab um, revolutions. And um, my observation was that there, the Arab world was sort of presented as this entity. Like, they didn't really make a difference between um, Egyptian, uh, uh, the Egyptian Twitter sphere, the Syrian blogger sphere, the Tunisian um, <laughs> online spaces. And there were headlines like um, Twitter revolution, Facebook revolution, all the time. <laughs> and my impression was that um, there was too much of this, oh, the Arab world is all the same and all the revolutions are all the same. And I also felt that the impact of social media was probably a little overrated. And I was wondering how you feel about that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, I mean, yes, I agree. I agree totally. And I think it is, I mean, we have to strike a balance and, and look at, at the positive impact that took place. There was a critical mass for sure that took place. There was, it was a moment of change. But at the end of the day, it's the, you know, there was a critical mass, but it's the masses that that made the difference and they made the, the movement. So on the one hand, we don't want to, um, I mean, on the one hand, we need to emphasize the role that was played, for sure. There was a role, especially in the context that we talked about, you know, historical context and the space that was open. And actually, mo all the more reason to give credit to the early adopters, because these are the ones, you know, through the online forums, through the blogs, these are the ones who built the platform for, for that sort of thing. And then Facebook and Twitter followed. But I totally agree. I think it's. Um, I think it was exaggerated. I think there was a hype around Facebook. Uh, I certainly, you know, the Facebook revolution, Twitter revolution, and all of that. I think it's overrated. 
still we need to, to, to uh, make sure that we acknowledge the role and study it and look at how it, this role was played alongside with the dynamics of what was happening on the ground as well. So these are my two cents. I see nodding heads across the board. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's 6.30, so I think we're going to end here. The conversation will definitely continue. There's a, a myriad of very, very interesting questions that have been put on the table here. So uh, you folks are going to be very, very busy for a while, and there's a lot of data to dig in as well. Um, uh, last piece is to thank you all for joining us here today and sharing thank your you insights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.